Kermaz listened with rapt attention as Curly filled him in on everything that had happened. Julian only chiming in to help her with technical terms and the parts she wasn't there for, including his initially fumbling experimentations with a reef and a god core synthesis. At some point, Ryan came in to listen, now that she was calm and had satisfactorily disassembled his key fob. God OS, does that mean something to you? Kermaz asked. OS is short for operating system. It's okay. So you know how the God Core has a bunch of images and words to help you understand what icons you're selecting? The operating system is what governs everything going on behind that. That's a vast, vast oversimplification of what's going on, but a lot of the things that really need to be explained requires terms that you don't have. So I'd basically have to define every single thing. I'd be okay with that, Ryan said, her elbows resting on the table and propping her head up. I bet you would, Curly said. But maybe when Kermaz and I have other things to do so we don't get bored to tears. <sighs> Ryan sighed and rolled her eyes, but didn't object. Here's the part I don't understand, Kermaz said. It's a citrine core, which means it needs lightning to power itself. You said you had a way to create lightning, but that the core won't let you do anything too powerful until it ranks up. Creating lightning seems like it's pretty powerful. Julian ran his hands through his hair, trying to figure out the best way to describe it. Okay, so have you ever had a hot, dry day when you're walking around and you touch something metal and you get a shock? Once or twice, Kermaz said, looking at the vast array of metal in his home. Well, it was a combination of home and a blacksmith shop. It had a main room with a table and simple fire pit for cooking. The table that they were using to talk right now could be moved easily to serve as a counter for his wares when not used for food. There was metal everywhere. The actual forge was in a separate place, but he still had plenty of finished wares here. I imagine you're intimately familiar with it. That little shock and lightning are basically the same thing. It's just a matter of scale. Like how when you close a door quickly, you get a brief gust of air but it's tiny compared to the force of a windstorm. Like how when you make constant wind with your bellows, but without muscle power involved. Not that you seem to be lacking in that department. I think I follow, Curly said. But how will you integrate the shocks in the first place? These three devices, Julian said, laying down the phone with the crafting menu showing. He'd expanded the descriptions so they could read the components. Steam engine one, boiler one, Pump one. Kermaz, Julian shouted. Callie, shield break on my mark. The lead Erlot turned in Julian's direction and pointed towards the alley. Someone sneak you over there. Krem, Moak, get him. Keeping their shields aimed toward the turrets, two of the Erlots charged towards Julian. Curly popped up on a roof and fired off a quick shot before she had to duck again as arrows filled the space she had just occupied. Kermaz and Callie burst out of hiding. This was the dangerous part. If Kermaz and Callie moved too far to the north, they could draw the turret's fire. If they didn't move far enough, they wouldn't be able to get into melee range of the one that had broken away from the pact. The first turret began to flash on Julian's minimap. The icon for the clip showed a red zero of 20. Turret one empty, Julian shouted. Curly leapt again sending an arrow almost straight down this time. It caught one of the Erlots directly in the top of his skull, and when he opened his jaw in surprise, part of his tongue fell from his mouth. Julian shuddered. Curly's second arrow uncovered the third turret just as Kermaz and Callie pulled out of the firing range. Kermaz swung his hammer in a massive side blow, just barely reaching his target. The Erlot spun from the impact as Callie dropped to her knees, sliding on her greaves in a manner Julian would have thought impossible. Her ultralight sword caught that erlot at the ankles and severed his legs from his feet. A crossbow bolt caught him in the neck as he fell. The number of standing melee erlots had been reduced to only two, the commander and another. Turrets out, Julian shouted, selecting one from his inventory. Kermaz and Callie exchanged a look and charged the commander while the turrets were down. The commander parried Kermaz's hammer with the haft of his spear, 
sending the overhead blow sliding harmlessly past him. Callie didn't go for the sliding strike this time, instead opting for a waist-high slash meant to cleave the massive warrior in two. He leapt smartly to the side and instead was only nicked by the blade. The commander reversed his grip on his spear and hurled it at Callie. She spun like a dancer and the spear glanced off her armor. Here, Julian got his first real look at the immense power Urkin were capable of using. Even that glancing blow still severed several rungs of her chainmail and drew a line of crimson on Callie's torso. She clutched at the wound with her free hand, and Julian had to wonder how she didn't scream.